Hello everybody and welcome to the 98th edition of the Frank and Stan chat and I'm delighted to say that uh, this week we have uh, Graham Duncan from Right to Succeed as our guest so good morning Graham. Good morning gents thank you so much for having me. Oh, it is definitely our pleasure we can't definitely. believe we've got people like you joining us it's a, a, an absolute treat for us so uh, thank you for, for giving us just over half an hour of your time today. Um, so Graham, how do you how do you know me, and what do you do, and how is life at the moment? <laughs> well, so Frank, you and I know each other um, very well from working together in Blackpool. I think you've been a massive gain for Blackpool over these last couple of years. So now you know why I brought you on as a guest. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you. That's not what you brought... said before. When we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you brought um, a, a level of kind of strategic thinking to the table in um, in Blackpool that has been incredibly powerful, I think, over these last couple of years, Frank. So Frank and I work together a lot in Blackpool. Um, I'm from a charity called Right to Succeed, and we do kind of place-based change work. We've been in Blackpool since our founding about seven years ago. Um, and we've done a lot of work. Um, I think we're particularly famous for the work on literacy, but the work on NEETS has really been developing as well. And we've done bits and pieces on inclusion along the way. But we're absolutely delighted to now be working on a 10 year education strategy with stakeholders across Blackpool with a view to starting implementation from September. So we've been doing a huge amount of work with Frank to kind of get the governance structure right and to bring all the kind of schools together to really form the sense of common agenda that they want to achieve. And, you know, essentially this is Blackpool and its schools saying we want to overcome the disadvantage factor for good for all the progress that's been made in Blackpool in these last few years through the opportunity areas, etc. There is still a long way to go, but the energy in the town now to kind of go and finally defeat this, I think is pretty incredible. So what made you get into this work then in the first place, Graham? So, you know what, Frank, it, it leads all the way back to being a teacher. I was on the first Teach First cohort back in the day um, and was parachuted into a school in London um, and met these extraordinary children and young people um, who weren't much younger than I was at the time and just realised for all the potential they had, how badly they'd been let down by their education, by the kind of community and system around them as well. And I was incredibly frustrated that that waste of human potential could exist in what was supposed to be a developed country. Um, and I suppose everything I've done since has been trying to solve those challenges that my form group, my uh, girls football team were facing on a, on a daily basis. and. Um, I, we're, we're, we're kind of seven years into our journey, but the impact that we're starting to see is just incredible. When you get people... Oh, we've lost... Have I lost the sound there, Stan? Organisations. Oh, no, we lost you a bit there. It's just say that again, Graham. Just, it's, it might be my end, but anyway, you just say that again, Graham. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're seven years in. Um, the impacts we're starting to see now, when you bring together you know, the schools, the public sector services, the community organisations, the residents to go solve problems together is just incredible. We were, we were, um, we had a presentation yesterday with um, stakeholders from across the Liverpool city region about a project we've got in the region in North Birkenhead. You know, the, um, we've put a multidisciplinary team in there with rural councils, 17.2 key workers, family workers, social workers, etc., all based at the centre of the community. On some of the key metrics, that team has outperformed worldwide metrics by a factor of three. And the thing that really came across yesterday was the joy of those professionals working in that way, where instead of having to cross refer to different services across the world, they call a colleague in from the office in the community who then comes and helps them with that family. And it's just making such a difference so quickly. The schools in that context, they when we first did the baseline assessment at the start of the year, and, and bear in mind, this is during a pandemic year as well. The children were 15 months behind reading age expectations. In that first year, they've caught up half of that gap. So it's quite incredible what happens when people come together to start to solve the kind of big issues facing their children and young people in their community. And we're one of few people that are privileged enough to kind of be able to do this kind of work. Fantastic, yeah. Um, Linked link very well with Mike Claddingbowl last week and his, you know, 
let, let's have a let's have a relook at, at what we do with education and mm. let's do it together rather than the top down model that we we, we do seem to get. Yeah, absolutely. And, and schools have become the holder of so many issues, right, because as services around them have fallen away during austerity, they just end up holding the mental health issues that the child is facing, yeah. special educational needs that they can't get any HCP plan for, and they have to deal with it on a daily basis and all the consequences that come with that. And it's, it's just not fair for a lot of these schools. Yeah, I agree. And I it's, agree. it's made worse when Ofsted say you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, well, that, you're coming on to what's caught your eye this week for me. So let's get on to that one. Stan, uh, what sort of week? Well, I think you've had a bit of a tough week, I think, this week. Not, not a good week. It, it does seem to be. I've, there's been too many Fridays when I've been talking about people <laughs> I know that have died. I feel like the harbinger of death sometimes on a Friday. Uh, yeah, I've lost a, a really good friend uh, who, I mean, he's older than me, thankfully. It's not, <laughs> it's not somebody my age, but... Uh, somebody I've known since I was seven and right the way through my, my life. And uh, it was just a bit of a shock and, and uh, very sad. Uh, and then my mother, who's in a, a nursing home, has fallen for the second time and may have broken her hip a second mm. time. Sure. But apart from that, the week's gone swimmingly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what's caught your eye this week? Well, I, I was, we, we did the, uh, the conference last week where we talked a little bit about the white paper and I was having another look through it, as you do, and, and picked up this bit that says, we will also consult on the exceptional circumstances in which a good school could request the regulator to agree to moving that school to a stronger trust. And that's, a, it doesn't say any more, doesn't give you any details about how that will work, but it's clear that whoever's written that mm -hmm. has no idea about the structure in a multi-academy trust because who would make that request? That <clears throat> There isn't a, a legal entity that's the school once it's yeah. in the trust, it's, it's part of the trust. So it just, I, I do think there ought to be some mechanism where, where the school has a right to say we are not being well treated or we, we're not with the, getting the best support we could have. But that needs a complete rewrite of the, the legal stuff around how you set a mat up. And it means that schools have to retain independent governance within a mat, which would be a nightmare. Uh, well, I also, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, Stan. I hadn't really thought about it in that sense. But um, if, if a school, if, if your structure within a trust is whereby all of your reserves are all pulled together, which is basically what the government are wanting to see actually how you extricate what are the reserves for that school or the debts for that school when they go into a new trust i, I don't know how you unpick that um you know i i i, I you can i can see how a, a complete trust on mass goes across to another trust i can see how that happens but actually cherry picking you know potentially you know good schools or whatever or even weak schools schools that a trust have tried to turn around but can't have not managed it. How you extricate them from that sort of trust structure, I think is beyond me as to how you can do that yeah. fairly. I mean, my practical sort of look at it is who could make that request? Yeah. Because, you know, the governors, if there are, if there is a governing board, are answerable to the trust, not, not independent. The staff are employed by the trust. Yeah. So, you know, who puts their hands up and says, we want to go? Yeah. <laughs> That's very easy. Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> you, you go I, I just think it shows a lack of understanding. And the other thing I find interesting in it is that it talks about moving to a stronger trust without using the fact that that means that that trust that they're in is weak in some way. And, and because we can't have, if we're having a totally trust-led system, we can't have a suggestion that there are weak trusts we just talk about stronger ones yeah, rather than yeah. talking about the fact that in every walk of life, there are strengths and weaknesses in organisations. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, I remember being responsible for uh, moving a college, sixth form college into the co-op academies trust. And actually that required some sort of careful discussions with ministers about payments to, to actually ensure that they, they were sort of, there was some sort of, soft landing i suppose is one way of describing it because in effect this this college was not didn't have enough pupil students in it to make it sustainable yeah. so but they didn't want it to close you know and it couldn't sit within its existing 
structure. So, you know, if if the government think that that this is going to happen, and I suppose the word is exceptional. It can't happen regularly because those payments are going to grow massively as people realise that this school is in the mire, this 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 academy is in the mire. You know, no one in their right mind is going to take that on just carrying on with existing funding arrangements because there's going to be a loss. You know, there's going to be a heavy investment required for that school. Um, what's caught your eye? I'll just finish. I'll just say, when you look through the white paper again, it's, it's flat, isn't it? There's nothing in it that grabs you and says, wow, we're moving forward. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, it's uh, got a lot of targets, isn't it? Um, you know, a lot of numbers, but a lot of announcements that have already been made. You know, when you look, when you unpick the new announcements in it, they're not that many. Um, what's caught your eye this week, Graham? Uh, I suppose it's the white paper as well, but the the literacy and numeracy aspects of the white paper, um, in particular. Um, firstly, I find it a little strange that literacy and numeracy have been given the same billing. Um, because actually, if you go and talk to EEF, and particularly Professor Jonathan Sharples at the EEF, um, they did a piece of work looking at um, what predicts different GCSE outcomes, and they came to the conclusion that across everyone that they looked at, literacy was the biggest, biggest driver of outcomes. Even in maths, numeracy was below literacy. So whilst you know numeracy is important, I, I don't think it should be given equal billing with literacy because for, for me, literacy is the master skill in education that unlocks everything from, from there forwards, including how you do your maths, uh, because you need a reading age of 14 to 15 to access the GD, GCSE paper each year. So that kind of gives you a sense of that. The, the thing that then really disappoints me is it just doesn't go far enough, but I think that's probably a common theme across the entire white paper. Um, Frank will remember we had, um, um, we had the Secretary of State come visit um, the literacy project um, in Blackpool, which has been a huge success. Children year on year, you say tree in Blackpool have beaten national expectations, gradually closing a kind of uh, a, a year wide gap um, in, in reading expectations. Um, and what he saw was uh, all the secondary schools and the pupil referral unit working very closely together. They assess children uh, twice a year. Um, in the meantime, they're then pr uh, putting intervention in at three levels. What does everybody need? So what are the universal interventions? What do small groups of moderate need need? And then what do individuals with high levels of need need? And um, it's been incredibly effective over several years. Um, the Secretary of State left that night and launched a video that evening saying, we're going to take the learning we've seen today into national policy and we're going to expand this nationally. And then the white paper, what's in there? They're going to uh, do some sample assessments of literacy and numeracy at the end of Key Stage 3 from now onwards. And that's essentially really it. And yes, there'll be a bit of a focus on these aspects in the education investment areas and particularly the priority ones. But just this sense that they've seen something really magical that's a huge amount of energy from the professionals in Blackpool has led to some amazing outcomes and then somehow managed to make that just about doing sample <laughs> testing. I can't get my head around it, but hey-ho. I think I, I, I'm one of the things, Dan, I think that um, it hasn't taken a lot of funding to make this difference as well. You know, I think that, um, I mean, clearly the leadership, because um, uh, Stephen Tierney was involved, has been involved in this work, and he's been a guest on, on the Frankenstein chat. Um, but actually, I think Stephen would say that the, the simplicity of the program is is a crucial element to it and one whereby there's release time for uh, a member of staff from each of the secondary academies to come together to sort of just chat through some of the 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 issues which in many cases are, are similar issues but some of the solutions you know may be slightly different and nuanced in each of the academies i think that 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 has led to a feeling of united a united front against literacy you know to tackle it and in a way, um, it's not been um, a top down model either. You know, there's the expertise rests in the schools that the teachers know what they want to do. Um, this has enabled them to, to, to learn off each other and to agree, you know, a fairly simple, straightforward approach to this. And just finally, that GL assessment that they do, which Blackpool has done, um, which sits outside of the statutory assessments, 
has been vital in proving that this has worked, you know, and it goes back, you know, pre pandemic. So, you know, it's a it's a, an anchor point, I think, for for standards across the town in literacy, which many areas, many local authorities haven't got that. The uh, that the model of, of releasing teachers to work with each other is exactly the same as as the maths project that we uh, evaluated in Stoke. And you, you only need to talk to two teachers who've who've had the opportunity in secondary and primary to talk about transition, to look at the work that they're doing at both levels, to see the light bulbs come on. It, it, it's no, no real cost. It's, you know, maybe a supply teacher to release two teachers for, I mean, they were limited. I think it was about half a day at most. But even in that, to sit with, the, you know, for the secondary math specialist to sit with the year six teacher and look at what was going on in maths at, at key stage two. And they went back and they said to us, you know, wow, we have to really up our game, up, up our game now because they're doing stuff that we do in, in year seven and eight. So we need to really think about the way we structure our curriculum. Yeah. And that's that's very cheap to do. But you've got to give the schools and the group the autonomy to do it. And you've got to have the support from the leadership and, and the heads of secondary schools that we met and the primary schools had, had all bought into it yeah. big time. So there was that commitment from everybody. Yeah, the, the, the trick with this kind of work is making sure that one school's learning becomes everybody's learning. Yeah. Very quickly because, yeah. you know, the, the thing we've got to understand about, you know, schools serving communities like Blackpool is apart from the odd school here and there no there's been no kind of system-wide defeating of the issues that come with disadvantage um, and you know for, for me when we when we talk about disadvantage we're really talking about um, you know poverty yeah. uh, we're talking about economic disadvantage aren't we yeah. but then the effects that has upon people so First of all, if you if it's a household in poverty, the likelihood is that it's in poverty because the parents had a very poor educational experience themselves, and therefore can't support their child's development in a way we would love to love them to be able to. And also, poverty causes stress, um, and that can create all sorts of kind of mental health, domestic violence style issues within um, a, within a household as well. So. For me, the disadvantage effect is one about child development and it's one about child well-being that schools then have to learn how to grapple with and deal with. Um, and, you know, literacy is is that master skill, um, you know, and if they're coming from a household where their parents don't read to them or can't read to them um, and aren't scaffolding that, the school has a massive kind of developmental gap to make up on its own. And so it's really important that professionals are working together to kind of close those gaps. And there was a lovely article in the Times, uh, the TES recently, um, on the, in the magazine on a Friday, um, about South Shore Academy, who are one of the schools in this in this program, and that school has utterly transformed itself from a school that was trying to be closed, but it was only not closed because there wasn't capacity to move all of their children into other mm. schools in Blackpool to where it is today, which is on the cusp of getting hopefully at least a good in its next Ofsted, um, which will be the first time in its 30 year history that this school has ever been uh, good or better. Um, so, and they've done that all through literacy and, you know, they've realized that as children started to understand more, um, the lessons became calmer, they, be they started to make more progress, etc. As the teachers saw progress, they became keener and keener to all be literacy teachers at the same time as subject teachers. And you just get this sense of a virtuous cycle that they've been able to create within that school that has completely and utterly transformed the environment and the outcomes that that school is able to achieve. So that that's why, you know, we think literacy is such a kind of key aspect and it just isn't getting enough attention in right. this way. It's really interesting that um, talking about the visit from the Secretary of State, um, one of the um, junior ministers um, went to uh, Highfield Academy and uh, I was there for that. And uh, about six months prior to that, I think it may even be less than that, the school was judged as RI, even though many aspects of the school in the report were good. Um, and actually it was really, <laughs> the, the ministerial team went round the school and uh, it wasn't on show, but the, 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 all credit to Highfield, they brought the young people from uh, across the school in to speak directly to the ministers it was completely unscripted 
and they were an absolute credit to the town uh, as well as to their families and to their teachers but actually it was one of those moments where you know uh, one of the ministerial teams said this is such a great school you know um, this is really what we're after and I, and I, I remember saying there's a bit of an elephant in the room here and we should be honest about it you know an Ofsted inspection team came in here very recently and said it wasn't good and I, and I feel as though you know the points you're making there um, Graham about the focus and the challenge that there is in some of these communities is completely misunderstood by some of the inspectors that inspect our schools. And, and for me, the, what caught my eye this week was um, Judy Price Grimshaw, a former HMI, who again has been a guest on here. Uh, uh, we, we spoke to a head teacher um, who was inspected in October. And that school, um, I don't want to give too much away because I don't want to disclose that individual, but that school was a, a great school and was put to RI. And, th and the issue there was, co the constant issue was that she was simply not convinced. Nobody was convinced that these inspectors really understood that school. And there's something quite unique about this school. This is what drew me to it. And again, I can't tell you what that uniqueness is, but mm -hmm. this is probably one in 5,000 schools difference um, that, a number of the inspectors had no idea about that uniqueness until well into the inspection, you know, and, and, and it's that sort of sense of not really understanding what this school is is about, because if you don't understand the challenges, you can't really interpret the effectiveness without that understanding, because that's the point at which you can say, yeah, I get it now, you know, or actually, I feel as though you're still not stepping up enough. But if you you can't say that if you don't actually know what you're stepping up from. You know what those challenges are well if you remember frank 20 odd years ago when we started the view of um progress was that once you got a child to the standard level after that the progress should just be yeah. linear yeah continue and no suggestion that <laughs> to keep a disadvantaged child at the same level of progress involved a lot of work all the way through that child's yes. schooling and it was like, oh, well, you know, look, at the end of, of uh, early years, they're nearly all in line. So, hey, it's you know, <laughs> no yeah, concept it, of... of... It, it, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because we, we talk a lot about the power of early intervention and early intervention is very powerful. Yeah. But any study that's looked at what then happened post early intervention shows that the children dropped away again afterwards. Mm. Um, the very famous one in, in, in Scotland about um, uh, closing the word gap in early years and it was key workers working with parents to kind of help them speak to their, their children and they managed to completely close the word gap for these children in a very, very short space of time. And when they came back a year later to look again, it had gone straight back to normal again. Yeah. And just this sense that actually to the thing, the, the way that I can always think about it is, you know, to escape poverty, it's a bit like you know you, you need a rocket to kind of escape the gravity of the whole thing and you can't just fuel that rocket at the beginning and hope it makes it because at some point gravity is going to take over it needs to be well fueled for the entire journey to be able to find that's the kind of vision i've always got in my head when we're thinking about the issue of poverty it's not about early intervention it's not about late intervention it's about intervention the whole way through and support to overcome the because let's face it our education system is designed by the middle classes for the middle classes and if you work in a middle class community where you know child development is taken care of as much at home as it is in school the whole thing works but then when you get into a community where that's not the case the school has to do an unbelievable job just to get that child back to average you know the average of, of everybody else so um that's never taken into, into account properly by you know, Ofsted um, mm -hmm. in general, but uh, frankly, we've seen in Blackpool, Blackpool used to have a kind of slew of leaders who came to Blackpool for their last job to come uh, from nice middle-class communities in Lancashire to kind of bring the model with them to then just find it just didn't work. Right. It just didn't work. Their entire experience in a different context wasn't fit for purpose for what was actually required for Blackpool. We, we've said this, Graham, so often that, that there still hangs about a theory that, that great teachers are in outstanding schools and we can move them to schools that are not outstanding and make those schools good. And, and there's no evidence as far as I've seen in any report that shows that that's true. 
but it's something that's that's believed and it's believed by people at the top of the the tree yeah uh, education's a calling but the extreme end of that calling is to go and work in communities like Blackpool, where yeah. frankly you can make by far the biggest difference yeah. that you could ever make as a teacher, and you find quite a self-selecting bunch mm. when you when you when you come into places like Blackpool. You know these these are the heroes of our education yes. sector, and you will find more passion in these communities than you'll find anywhere else. Um, and I, I find it utterly inspiring to be able to work with these people all the time. But yeah, for me, this is the kind of extreme end of heroism within yeah. the education sector. And, you, yeah. and presumably you can, you can replicate that, that area of disadvantage in, in places like Burnley and Salford and, and parts of Manchester. And, and it's the same thing that, that's happening and we, and we need a, a solution to it, but it's got to cost money. Yeah, it is going to cost money. And it's back to that point again, is it's about the fastest way to beating this is schools working together to make sure every every piece of learning they all have about how they beat these various issues becomes everybody's learning very quickly and becomes everybody's practice uh, and so for, for me that's the most efficient and effective route out of this but it means giving these people time and resource to go finally beat this the the disadvantage effect that we see throughout our education system i think one of the things Stan, that's worked very well though is um the CEOs, because all the secondary academies, secondary schools are academies, but the way the CEOs have come together in a very open way that it's not been very well in my involvement with them over the last two and a bit years. It, it's been about what's good for Blackpool as opposed to what's good for our trust, you know, and there is that sense of people coming together and it, it, it on an equal footing so there isn't anybody saying oh well i'm a you know we've got a good school here you know it's actually been about well you know the likes of south shore the likes of highford what can we do to actually bring those schools up what support can we offer together um and actually there have been occasions when that relationship has been tested but actually i think people realize there's a there's there's too much to lose by going out on your own and making a name for yourself because you're going to lose too much. You're going to lose all of this support, all this goodwill, you know, and actually it's, it's a brave person in black, particularly once who feels as though we're going to make ourselves very, very different and very much better than anybody else. We'll all make progress together. And I think that's what that key stage three project on literacy has proved. I think. Couldn't that yeah. be enhanced by something I know we talked about years ago now, of changing the mode of inspection. So you, you inspected areas mm. rather than individual schools. And you actually then reported on what it's like to live in this area. What are the quality of well, schools? Quality? Anybody who inspected Highfield, anybody who inspects South Shore and other schools in Blackpool at the moment, if they don't give credit, full credit to that key stage three literacy program, mm. you know, and actually explain how that has happened, you know, I mean, in a way, you've got you've got to feel as though these are schools that are are definitely improving, and actually, but when you look at the Highfield report, it could be of anywhere. Yeah, it really. Is. It, if the inspection it, then was, let's look at you know north of Blackpool. Let's look at an area that I don't know the the names of the areas in Blackpool, but let's look at that and let's take into account all the schools, all the health support all the, the youth support and make a report that says this is what it's like to live in this area and this is what this area needs it's what it's doing well what it's not doing as well and then the schools and other organizations that join into that are not feeling as though well i'll do it but i've got to protect myself as well yeah that, that's one of the barriers when i worked in wakefield that was one of the barriers we, we want to work with schools that are not as good as us of course we do we all know that you know, teachers want to do that, but if it's going to damage my school's performance, then I have to think about it very carefully. Well, Graham, you've got experience of this. I mean, in a sense, you're an insider and an outsider in all of this, aren't you? I mean, is 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 it really that there's still too much competition, too too little joined up thinking in terms of how things are 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 delivered? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, every place is slightly different, of course, Frank. In that there's a slightly different dynamic. The dynamic in Blackpool has shifted remarkably from when we first arrived about seven years ago. Seven years ago, we were post the academy carve up 
it had been brutal, it had been really poorly managed, hyper competitive. And the leaders from particularly the secondary schools, I didn't know the primary schools particularly well then, but the, the leaders from the secondary schools hadn't been in a room together for two years when we first arrived. To where that dynamic is today, the, the leaders have done a 180 on that. You know, the sense of collective working in Blackpool is probably stronger than anywhere else you could possibly imagine. And there is this kind of unified front against the effects of disadvantage, if you like. Um, so it is a truly impressive kind of turnaround in the town. I think the town is reaping the benefits of that as well. And I think the leaders understand now the benefits of doing it this way. So I think we've got some evangelists as well for kind of collective collective working. Um, everywhere we go these days, it's a bit easier to bring people together because everybody kind of went through some sort of carve up at some point and it's calmed right. down a bit. So it all feels a bit easier these days to be able to bring schools from different under different banners together. So our work over these years has become a bit easier every year, I'd say. Um, but there, you know, there have been some pretty dark times in terms of just trying to bring schools together to try and solve those big issues there their local community suffers from. So in terms of right to succeed, I mean, because um, we're nearly at 30 minutes into the chat, I mean, what are the challenges for you at the moment? I mean, is it is it because you're getting people coming together, but is it actually just resources? Yeah, it's always resources, Frank, because we're slightly swimming against the tide of the way commissioning is done, the way philanthropy is done, because we do massive projects in relatively small communities um, and people like to fund massive projects spread across many, many things or small projects in small communities. Um, so we're kind of always running against the tide. So our challenge is always joining the dots together on what all the resource that is required. Because, you know, if you look at Blackpool, this 10 year education strategy we're working on, the first three years are going to cost somewhere between eight to 10 million. Yeah. Um, and we'll get past half of that just from what the council and the Department of Education are going to contribute to Blackpool. Um, and I think that, for me, is a real show of trust in this community and the way the schools are now working and, and the progress that's been achieved under the, uh, under the opportunity area. But that leaves a kind of two and a half million to four and a half million kind of gap to fill. And that's a big gap to fill, right? That's to, that's to do that all belts and braces version that Blackpool deserves. And the schools will no doubt have to contribute something towards that, but we don't want to put, be putting too much pressure on school budgets either because, you know, for places like Blackpool, they've probably been underfunded historically mm. for decades anyway. They've had all the real term cuts over the last few years. And yes, there's going to be a bit of a recovery now, but I still don't see that Blackpool schools are going to be funded in the way they deserve for the scale of challenge they have to overcome anytime soon. So do other uh, other communities, like you've mentioned North Birkenhead, I think, and and Blackpool, are there other areas where you're engaged? I mean, how, how, yeah. how wide are you in terms of a national perspective? So um, we're, we're getting wider all the time. So um, we've just opened up in Great Yarmouth, for example, where we're looking at a kind of cradle to career style intervention in their most left behind ward in which is uh, a place called nelson which you've ever been to great yarmouth is where the fun fair is and where all the guest houses used to be but it's a very similar story to blackpool frank in that a lot of those guest houses as tourism's um gone to spain and other such um places they started to become houses of multiple occupation so it therefore becomes a very cheap place to live and in floods, you know, a, um, a, a cohort of mm. people who are at the bottom of the kind of social ladder. And then the local community has to work out how um, the community moves forwards from there. So, and then we're working, we, we've got a project in North Birkenhead that Liverpool City Region has asked us to uh, replicate in the most left behind wards of each of their local authorities. So there's kind of five of those coming. And then um, we are also hoping to open up a, another major programme on inclusion in one of the Greater Manchester local authorities, but we're just trying to get to the bottom of uh, sealing the contract on that right now. So that plus the 10-year strategy in Blackpool is kind of what's keeping us busy at the moment. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, a really interesting chat, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, Stan, you look, so you're just about to say something. I was just thinking we haven't got round to what got your eye, Frank. Oh, well, actually, no, I, I we, well, it was the issue around that uh, head teacher um, who'd had the inspection wow. in the autumn. Um, and and I, what I intend to do is uh, um, 
draft that up as a, as a paper. Um, I think that there are a number of head teachers who have written pieces about how did it feel and obviously obviously Ofsted is very keen to put forward the yeah you know, the positive experience of which there are many but actually I think when it's a negative experience I think that head teachers if they write that themselves find it very you know it becomes just their their experience whereas I think somebody like myself writing it on the basis of I don't know how many schools I've visited how many schools I've inspected how many school reports I've signed off I think it might just carry a little bit more weight and, and bring a different sort of angle to it so you know, I hope that I'll, I'll certainly put that out, and hopefully people will be drawn to it. I, it for me, the, the the thing that sticks in my head from that conversation yesterday was this professional arrogance that inspector, the inspection team that came to her school, gave her. You know, she got that sense that I'm not in this. You know, I'm not in the. I'm not in this sort of group. I've not been trained. I've not had all this. This is a group that see themselves as over and above me rather than seeing me as a partner and 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 she as she said only one of those uh, inspectors actually well none of them are head teachers at the moment one of them is an exec head the others are not so she said i just felt as though i was being put in my place right from the beginning and and that's wrong you know that that is completely wrong um and uh, yeah this is a you know i was impressed by this by this head teacher the way that she'd just and the way the community got round her and said, you know, wrote to Ofsted, this is not right, this is wrong. But Ofsted's approach is we're never wrong. Yeah. You know, that's what's wrong with Ofsted. You know, well, until until a almost a, a a legal review of Ofsted's complaints procedure it exposes yeah. it for what it is, which is is a sham, isn't it? Because it is. if you complain, you're not allowed to see the evidence that's against yeah. you. And <laughs> what kind of what kind of fair system? And also, the evidence is not all written down anyway. You yeah. know, that, at the end of the day, you, you are relying on professional judgment. At the end of the day, and and I think some inspectors have been uh, either confused or scared of what might happen to them if they lose their badge. And actually, they need to. And we know Stein and I know of a number of H, uh, a former HMI who have lost their badge or decided to lose the badge or decided to leave because they can't. Yeah, we can't deal with it anymore. So I think that yeah, there needs to be a radical review of that complaints procedure because all the all the uh, parents who wrote to Ofsted, of which there were many, all they would all they got was a standard reply and saying, "Well, you need to follow the complaints procedure," <laughs> and and they had such little confidence in that they decided not to and just to sort of put a hug around the the head and hug around the school. The schools the schools moved on. You know, it's it's a much better school. Um, but that's not because of Ofsted. That's because the community value it. Mm. Anyway, so that was what my what's going to caught my eye. <laughs> so, Graham, can I thank you very much for your time? Yeah, thank, you. Uh, no, thank you, James. Really yeah, it's been really interesting because it's been a different angle. I think you brought a different perspective to our chat. So, thank you very much for that. And again, if anybody wants to make contact with Graham because they think their community needs a bit of right to succeed. Uh, you just have to search for right to succeed uh, and uh, uh, Graham's name will pop up with his contact details. And before we go, Graham, the football shirts in the background is something that Stan was drawn to. What, what are uh, so that, those are cycling shirts over there, but I have cycling got, shirts. Steve, I've got Stephen Gerrard grinning at me over here. Oh, have you? Holding oh, the never head, mind. So. <laughs> well, I should, <laughs> actually, it's taking a dip now, but anyway, we'll get over it. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing uh, uh, well, seeing you next week. But also, if you listen on the podcast, uh, we hope you enjoy that as well. And uh, we're heading towards that hundredth edition, so uh, uh, and we've got uh, Professor Andy Hargreaves is going to join us for that in. Uh, two two weeks time so uh, okay well thank you very much and uh, we'll see you all all being well next week thank you gents take care <laughs>